Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My name is Todd Harden. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Plastic Oceans International. I'm super excited to welcome those of you uh, logging on to the second in our series of six panel discussions uh, related to our Trees and Seas Festival. Um, you're joining us here for the value of eco-friendly entrepreneurship, how innovative companies are embracing sustainable products and practices, not only to the benefit of our planet, but also to their bottom line. Uh, so I welcome all of you to that. Real quickly, a little bit about Trees and Seas. Again, this is all part of our Trees and Seas Festival. Um, we're operating events in over 30 locations worldwide. Much of them are also remote, such as these. Um, we've got, we're planting nearly 100,000 trees. We've got over 100 cleanups around the world, um, over 30 workshops, film screenings, and music performances as well, um, in addition, of course, to these panel discussions. All the panel discussions are, are offered at absolutely no cost. Registration is free. Um, and we really need to thank sponsors such as Montez Wines, for example, as our presenting sponsor. Um, some of those we have folks right here from, from Foamy, from NatraCare, and from Bamboo Brush um, as well um, that we would be uh, remiss without, um, without recognizing uh, for their support as well. So we are going to do one thing at the end. We are giving away five copies of our hardcover edition of Living Without Plastic. Um, it's our it's our new book came out earlier this year published by artisan books we're going to announce those randomly selected winners at the end of the panel so kind of hang tight when we're done we'll show those names up on the screen and we'll make sure we get in touch with you to get your books uh, shipped out to you um, and again that will be at the end of the panel that will do that um, keep in mind this is meant to be an interactive experience you can certainly um, provide questions that you have uh, we do have a Q&A box in in zoom that you can drop questions into and also into chat on YouTube Facebook and LinkedIn depending on where you're logging on uh, to the discussion from um, once again this is the value of eco-friendly entrepreneurship how innovative companies are embracing sustainable products um, um, and practices on the benefit of the planet as well as their bottom line. So we're going to be discussing how all four companies featured here were founded on the principle of offering products that are more sustainable and that fill a consumer need. So with that, let me let me briefly introduce all of our panelists. First up is Susie Houston. Uh, Houston, sorry, Susie. Um, she's the founder and developer of NatraCare, a lifetime environmentalist and disruptor and somebody with immense respect for humanity in the natural world. She's pioneering having developed the world's first brand of organic and natural period products in 1989. So we welcome Susie Houston to the conversation. Um, in addition, Nicholas Epstein is the manager, managing director of New Flag and also the co-founder of Foamy, which produces plastic-free shampoo, body, and face bars. Um, he's also a graduate of Manchester University. Uh, Tommy Eaton is the founder of Bamboo Brush and an environment and the environmental project director at Humanitas Charity. His original background was in education before embarking on a three-month trip through Asia, which opened his eyes to the uh, for caring for the planet and experiencing cultures across the globe. And finally, our moderator is John Davies, who is an environmental and outdoor writer and editor. Um, he's the former editor in, in chief of New Mexico Magazine and Powder Magazine. Um, and currently serves as the brand editorial director at Avocado Green Brands, makers of Avocado Green Mattresses. So with that, again, I welcome all of our panelists. I thank everybody for, for logging on to the discussion and uh, stay, tuned, uh, stay tuned for winners for the books and more information at the end. With that, Mr. Davies, I turn it over to you. Hello, I am so excited and grateful to be here today. Thank you, Todd and Plastic Oceans International for organizing this panel, the value of eco-friendly entrepreneurship. Uh, this is something I'm really excited about. I think about it, I think, every day. How can we use our businesses to advocate for environmental and social responsibility? And how can we effectively communicate the value of these ideals to customers? Can an eco-friendly company really be profitable? Before we dive in, I'd love to tell you a little more about the work we do at Avocado. Like Todd said, my name is John, and I want to acknowledge that I'm calling in from New Mexico, near the traditional and current homelands of Taos Pueblo, a community known for its land stewardship and conservation. I'm the brand editorial director for Avocado Green Brands. We're climate neutral certified and a certified B Corps, and we're proud members of 1% for the Planet, through which we've donated millions of dollars to more than 30 nonprofits. We handcraft organic certified mattresses, bedding and pillows, and sustainable furniture, but we don't really consider ourselves a mattress or furniture company. 
we really think about avocado as an environmental platform. For avocado, and I think for the amazing panelists joining us today, the question isn't, can an eco-friendly company be profitable? For us, there's really no other way. It's fundamental to who we are. We believe in a healthier way to do business. We are compelled by a warming planet, by polluted oceans and communities, by racial and other systemic inequalities to ensure our decisions support people and the planet. I think all of us on the panel share a vision, not just to reduce plastic pollution, which we all do, but more broadly speaking, that companies can genuinely be good for people and the planet. And that those companies, our companies, can be successful not despite their commitments to environmental and social responsibility, but because of them. And that by doing business this way, we can build a more fair and resilient economy for all. We have to, because we know that the status quo, toxic products, seas of plastics, a dangerously warming planet, it's just not going to work. It's not sustainable. So how do we do it all? How are we successful and profitable and forces for good? We're gonna hear from our amazing panel to find out what that takes. To start, I'd love for each of you to tell us more about yourselves and why you started your company. What inspired you and how and why is sustainability at the forefront of your business? Susie, let's start with you. Hi there, and hello to everyone. It's amazing to see how many people have, in this community around the world have joined in. So thank you for joining us. It's great, great to see so many people who are enthused about this subject. So yeah, I'm a troublemaker. Established the, um, established the rules here. Um, I, I started life as a you know, inner city working class girl inspired to work through the educational system to become socially mobile. I, work, I, went, I was an art student, so um, maybe you can understand that art students are well radicalized by the philosophy that we read. Um, and from a socialist family, sorry for people in America when I use the word socialism, but it basically in my, from where I come from, it means being equal and sharing and um, sharing responsibility, sharing what we have amongst those who don't. So I, I sort of grown up in that environment. Um, so it means that ultimately um, from the time of being on my father's allotment, I've been um, connected to the environment because when you're devoid of a, of, a, of a beautiful environment and you see that small space, you want to protect it. So I kind of started my business as a campaign. Uh, I didn't start, I didn't start a business. I, I, I began a campaign um, and the, the steps that I went along and the, and the difficulties that I went along meant that the business had to, to, to be created to sustain that progress. Um, so um, for all budding ent entrepreneurs out there, um, you have to say that um, I spent my first 10 years non-salaried. Uh, everything that came into the business, I put back into the work that we were doing. So um, I didn't seek for a product. I sought to solve a problem. Thanks so much, Susie. I'm excited to talk to you more about your troublemaking in a bit. Um, Tommy, we'd love, love to hear more from you. Hi all from all over the world. And thank you for, um, yeah, thanks for having me on to tell our story. Um, what a great week that Plastic Oceans and Trees and Seas have got planned. Um, but yeah, I'll try not, I'll try and keep it short. Um, but uh, my background, my background was I always wanted to be in teaching. So I always wanted to, always wanted to be a PE teacher. PE and sport was my passion. Went to university, um, came out of university, went into the education system and uh, then went on a a three month backpacker trip, essentially, like a lot of people do. Very lucky to be able to travel. Um, Todd did on the intro um, say it was just three months, but actually what ended up happening was three months very quickly turned into seven years. And I was very lucky to, I was very lucky, me and my partner, Rebecca, um, was very lucky to be able to live and work in specifically Asia and the East, which was amazing. Um, and we worked in we worked in social media a lot. So we worked within travel industry. We worked within promoting travel. And um, what we started to see, sorry, and Rebecca's background was quite similar, but a little bit different. When Rebecca finished school, um, she just wanted to travel. So she saved up for a year. Rebecca doesn't wear shoes. That pretty much sums up Rebecca. So she booked a one way flight to Thailand and she was she lived well, she lived in Asia for about 10 years. So 
both of our hearts are, are in Asia. But what we started to do as we were working, um, as we were working in Asia for so long, and we were promoting travel. This was our this was our role. We had to promote all these incredible places. But what we started to see was the one, the dramatic increase of plastic pollution in our environment. But then we started to see how that plastic was impacting everyday people in these lower socioeconomic regions of the world. That started to open our minds into, I don't want to swear on the thing, but oh my God, um, this is not right. We, we openly say that we're not experts in anything, but we certainly have a passion about what we deliver. So uh, we starting to look into um, environmental, the, the environmental causes of this. Um, it was very apparent that plastic was everywhere, but we wanted to understand why. We then started to work with the hotel chains and travel and tourism boards and travel companies who we were previously working with, but on a more sustainable, sustainability focused avenue. So again, we're not, we're not experts in any way. So I don't know how to do, how to combat this bigger picture around climate change and sustainability. But one thing we did really know how to do was get people engaged and get people out there taking action. So we work with tourism boards to organize big beach cleanups. We work with hotel chains to make sure that they had um, water, uh, refillable water stations so people aren't buying water, um, plastic water bottles. Work with travel companies to make sure that they were employing local people instead of bringing external um, overseas employees. So that's kind of where everything started. Um, and then we did that for about two, about 18 months, two years. And that's where we, I think selfishly is the wrong word, but it is the right word. We wanted to deliver that action ourselves. So we wanted to, we essentially, we wanted to create a business that was able to give back um, to people that we were very lucky to all. I, I think everyone in this room and everyone on this panel can, uh, and everyone in uh, listening in can understand that, there's a lot of people who have a lot less and they're more generous than people who have a lot more. And we wanted to be able to give back to the people who had given us so much. So we didn't have much, we didn't have much money. In fact, we didn't have barely any money, but we wanted to use our platform of social media in a positive way. Um, and wanted to inspire people to make one simple change. It kind of, it goes back to our aspect of that we're not experts, but what can we do to, get one everyday person, an everyday person to make one simple change onto their, onto the first step of their ladder around sustainability. And that's where we, we came up with our um, beautiful bamboo, at bamboo brushes. Um, and then we launched, and that's all it was, it was as simple as that. So one simple change. We launched in, we launched in February, 2019. So two and a bit years ago, we had a crazy campaign, which was hashtag 1 million by 2020, um, which was essentially we wanted to educate and inspire a million people to make a change um, from the stereotypical plastic toothbrush to one of our at bamboo brushes. Alongside that, my going to my background in education, we developed educational workshops that we deliver in schools. And then going back to our work in back in Asia with cleanups, we organized big community cleanups. So that was it. We went off. And then fast forward two and a half years, um, we hit our hashtag 1 million by 2020 within, within nine months, which was pretty crazy, all from the bedroom at my mum and dad's house. Um, we, we've educated over 2,000 children. We've, we've, uh, we've, we've delivered 26 cleanups. And our biggest, our, our biggest achievement, I think, um, that we're really proud of is we've, we've, we've launched our first social impact project um, in Ghana alongside um, Humanitas Charity in which we've now become the environmental project directors. So I can talk about this later and I feel like I've waffled on. But yeah, that's us in short. Essentially, we created a business in which is really simple. And we now have a full range of products that are all linked to the top 10 ocean polluters. But our products fund our social impact projects um, we have one at the moment, but the whole idea of the projects is to create a, a blueprint, an open source blueprint that we could just go boom to every single developing community around the world. They can replicate and there'll be a there'll be a system to utilize unrecycled plastics. That's me.
I can talk for England. So thank you, John. Thank you, Tommy. What a great story. I love it. Uh, Nikki, I'd love to hear about what inspired you to start Foamy and learn a little bit more about your background. Sure. Um, so again, thank you very much for having me. Super exciting. Um, I founded the business New Flag, which is sort of the mother company of Foamy in 2010, alongside my best friend. We've known each other since third grade. We grew up together and then we had this crazy idea of going into the personal care and beauty world. And we grew our business and being part of this fast moving consumer goods industry and beauty industry, we then realized a few years in the whole issue of plastic pollution and um, the lack of recycling in many, many countries. And that the time has come for really a 100% plastic free brand and not only one that sort of uh, preaches sustainability, but really takes this topic of plastic pollution and plastic free lifestyle uh, to heart and, and is very, very serious about it. And we started um, at first only with one single product in 2018. It was a shampoo bar and shampoo bars have been around for quite some time. And um, so we are not the inventors of, of this, if you will, but we were pretty much the first ones to make a retail ready shampoo bar. So take it away from DIY uh, or do it yourself sort of at home projects to creating a brand and product, which then goes out into mass market retail. And in Germany, where our company is based, we were actually the very first brand to launch Foamy with um, shampoo bars into the drugstore, um, drugstore and retail space. And since then have really developed the entire line of products to um, become a 100% plastic free personal care routine. So what started with hair products now encompasses face and body. And we have deodorants, we have dry shampoo, we're launching kids, we're launching pets and more and more items are coming. Not only do we want to clean your body, but we also want to nourish it. So that one of the largest polluters in in the in the household which is the bathroom with all the shampoos and conditioners and beauty products and personal care products that you use tries and becomes less plastic heavy and probably in this round yeah we are not the most hard liners when it comes to plastic usage and we're not the ones that say never ever ever use plastic and if you use a piece of plastic you're a horrible person we just want to try and bring as many people to our brand or plastic free brands to make sure that plastic is eliminated and really have a global impact. And uh, we try and do this by creating fun products, which have a great scent, which are great to use and enjoyable from the experience. So um, thereby really hope to make as many people globally aware um, of this issue. Thanks so much, Nikki. Appreciate that. Susie, I want to go back to you when you we're introducing yourself, you use the word troublemaker and in previous conversations, you talked about your, your fearlessness and, you know, the need to be bold. Why do you think those traits are necessary in developing an eco-friendly business and making that work? I think my experience of, um, you can take an approach where you think that you come up with an idea and, and you can, um, you can do an assessment of how you think it's going to go, but you have to plan for all the disasters and dangers and the hard kicks that you're going to get along the way. So uh, I learned very early on, yes, I had no business experience. I was a designer. I mean, I was a graphic designer and a post grad in education, um, but I was smart enough to work out what I needed to do. Um, and along the way, because I was talking about a radical change in what was one of the biggest markets in the world, you know, there are 40 billion sanitary products thrown away every year. Uh, and I'm touching the nerves of the large corporates who are contributing to this and who is this? Who is this scallywag coming into the market? We can't find her in any, any directories. So um, I, I, there was a certain amount of naivety, but I think my upbringing was that you don't get bullied. Uh, if you know you're right, if you're on the right path, you have to deal with bullies. And, and bullying um, came in the way of, uh, you know, letters from lawyers, threats, harassment, um, campaigns against the ideology. Um, so that fearlessness and determination, you have to work through that. I've never, I've never, never made, said anything that I could never defend in court. Um, uh, I, you know, you have to have a belief in the principles that you're taking forward and you have to be well factored. You have to know your facts. It's no good making up, you know, marketing speak because that's the way you're going to get caught out. So I was very conscious. I need to do all the research I needed to do. I needed to get great people behind me. So scientists, good lawyers. 
uh, or a good lawyer, um, good researchers, and, and surround yourself with people who also share your aspirations to make a change in the world. So fearlessness has never lost me. I mean, I, I, as I said before, when we met, I mean, I had breast cancer last year. I've been through it. When you face that, you know, you face your potential, um, that those things, when you think you're facing all these things in, in your business, um, facing breast cancer, I'd already been prepared for those for those knocks because I'd experienced so much in business. So, okay, this is another thing I have to deal with. I have this thing around me. So, you, you, when you are when you when you're coming up with an idea where you solved an an environmental problem, and for us it was plastics, dioxin pollution, also TSS. Um, you have to be you have to have a fearlessness about you. You have to be bold enough to stick by your course and and find a way to deal with the fear that you know the first lawyers let you get, how you're going to cope with it, have a strategy, not to be to know that when you get that letter, you really have got them rattled. You've got them on the run. Um, and if you think like there's 30 years, through the 30 years, and even last year I was getting letters. Um, now we see brands, the, the top brands who were sending these letters have now seen the, the, the potential for moving into this, this, this sphere. So uh, in the end, you drag them along the way, but you, that, that fearlessness is something that keeps you going. Not recklessness, because that loses you a lot of money, um, but fearlessness is, is a key thing. Yeah, you touched on this a little bit, but now, you know, you're competing against these massive companies like Unilever and Procter and Gamble. How as a, you know, a, essentially a, a startup, one of the, you know, you're at the forefront of the space many years ago. How do you continue to to compete against those giant corporations? Oh, this, they, they're not doing it as great as we are. Um, I think we've done what we've always challenged is where are the standards? So if there are no standards, make sure that those standards exist. I mean, we were just contributors to the GOT6, actually GOT5 for organic standards in feminine hygiene, where we saw brands moving into the category using plastic applicators that were claimed to be plant-based. We sent the stuff off to Greenpeace Labs and had them tested. Uh, and we found out that they were just polyethylene acting the environment in the same way. So you use that information against the market. You know, we, we've always um, sought out standards created standards with international with independent organizations we um, plastic free organization soil association for us with the global organic textile standards um, we we've, we've, we've been through um, uh, em 13432 um, industrial composting certification um, so these things is you you stay we're staying ahead of the where I like to feel that we're the what the, the horses at the front of the coach um, and we know that when we look behind, there's going to be a few hitchhikers, but, but, but you have to deal with that. And we're always, you know, several gallops ahead to use the equestrian <laughs> metaphor here. I think we're doing quite well in the Olympics on equestrian, so I have to bring those in. Um, so we always, you know, we always want to be the horses at the front. And in some respects, yes, it is comp competition, um, uh, but, it, but ultimately I look at it as a way of dragging them up the scale of moving towards a more ecological basis for the products. Um, if they're going in that direction, that's great because that's the objective. Not, not you know, the objective wasn't to be you know the only brand in the market, but the but at the moment we are the only brand in the market that's doing everything as a, a, a with a mark of excellence um, that others can aspire to. Um, so yeah, yeah, there there are big guys out there, but you need to you know load load there's another equestrian thing you have to load your saddle with all all good positive things that, that are you um, and keep aspiring to do that and um, greenwashing is is greenwashing in marketing if you're trying to wash up your brand to make it look greener than it is your consumers are going to check you out and find you out straight away so being being ethical and 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 transparent is is the, what we do which is why we're we are leading the the chase um, but i think we've got a clear round so far I don't think I can get any more equestrian <laughs> metaphors in there. <laughs> uh, Susie, you know, I know the, the landscape for eco-friendly businesses has changed a lot in the past 5, 10, 15 years. What advice would you give someone who wants to start an eco-friendly business today? Um, I think plan. Planning is really critical. I mean, we all come up with really great ideas in the middle of the night. Uh, mine was one o'clock in the morning in the bathroom. 
having seen you know a program that exposed the amount of dioxin in the environment from the pulping industry but you know when when you've got that great idea and you've got an idea um you know write it all down um do a risk assessment i mean it sounds really boring because this is the quality control stuff coming here but do, really do a risk assessment really look at all the things that could go wrong as well as all the things that when you're coming up with a great idea you know you want you want to go right so you know planning for the things that can go wrong because you can you can become too too enthused with your idea um and you can end up losing a lot of money borrowing a lot of money losing a lot of friends so planning and and having contingencies for what you're going to do because you know the greatest ideas take do take some kind of financial investment um so you know plan really sort of do a war a war room plan of what what could go wrong and plan for those things have contingencies ask and if you don't if you can't find the information that you need then you know you're going to have to research it don't assume that something will pop along later on you really got to do your research ahead of the game but uh, but i think once you, if you when you have a good idea you also need to speak to your friends because they'll tell you you know are you sure i mean i spoke to one of my friends at the time who was the he was a European marketing manager for, for Pedigree Pet Foods, which is the Mars group. And I had this conversation. And I said, what do you think? He said, you're insane. He said, it's a huge market. It's a massive deal. You know, you might get destroyed, but go ahead. What are you going to lose? So, you know, talk to your friends because they'll, they will, you'll get those friends will say, oh, you're mad. Don't do it. And then you'll get those who are on the other end of the spectrum who will say, who will say yeah, go for it. It's great. So you need to listen you need to listen um and 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 then if you really really believe that your plan of action your idea is really going to solve an environmental problem not just think that it's going to lead to making you a lot of money then your heart will stay with that project i mean i've been doing this 31 years now i still still feel that same passion for what i do um, which drives me forward so that's about, about the best advice. I mean, there's lots of advice I could give you. Regular age, regulations, you know, blah, blah. But, you know, they're, they're the key things that you need to hold when you start off. Susie, can I ask a quick question? Sorry to jump in, John. Yeah. You're saying you, like you've done this for 31 years and your passion yeah. is, is, is just as fire fueled now as it, as, as, as it was at the start. Do you think it's more inspiring now that there's more are you personally more inspired now because there's more people in this space or how do you know what yeah, I mean? yeah I, well i think i was always ahead of the curve you know i was doing organic tampons when there were no real organic standards mm. um and, and also consumers were you know the, the organic the organic consumer was was you know classically she's seven 1970s woodstock people which i you know being an art student i was kind of in that room um but then, you know, things change. I, I, I always say this, I'm, I'm sorry to take this on a weird tack, but I was just having this conversation with somebody the other day, because I'm old enough to remember. But in the 70s, in the late 70s, we had this massive hole in the ozone there. And, and the whole world sort of stood up to, my God, we you know, if we don't deal with this, what's the cause of this? Oh, it's these, it's all this stuff that's doing this, you know, hairsprays, deodorant sprays, refrigerators. But the world took notice because they could they could see and they understood the implication of that. So I think that that the 70s movement of, uh, of people in the environmental movement, the, the industry sort of saw that, that consumers were paying attention. So it's been a slow, slow roll. And you know, through the 80s of you know, greed and grab, um, uh, the 90s of you know, trying to look inwards and see what. But yes, I think this this the generation, you know, the generation that's followed has had good teaching from their parents, from their, you know, their schools who, who've sort of grown up with the same ideology and the, and the same awareness of this problem. So there is a groundswell of, of understanding that the principles of organic, the principles of removing plastic from the environment, the principles of um, ethical, ethical principles in business. Of sharing, um, you know, the wealth that you make from a business. You know, with one percent for the planet. Before one, we were assigned with one percent of the planet. We were giving money here, there, and everywhere to all sorts of projects, and we never talked about it. You know, we just did it because we. What's the point of making money if you're not doing something good with it? 
So yes, I think there, this, the generation that sits with us now, the, 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 the Greta Thunberg movement has, you know, she's a brave, fearless young woman who's raised the aspirations of a whole generation of young people around the planet, around the world, will join hands and say, enough is enough. You know, if, you know, if you're not going to do something about it, we're the generation coming up going to make you pay for it. So it definitely is, it definitely is the now. It's too late for many things. Back in the 70s was when we should have been doing all this attention. Um, but it is better than nothing. And it's definitely if you if you if you're looking to engage with those people with products that they really can see and measure is going to make a, a change to what they aspire for the world, then you you're you're going to be here for 30 years plus, I guess. Great question, Tommy, and thanks so much, Susie. Uh, so we also want to hear from everybody listening in. So throughout our conversation, we're going to drop some poll questions into Zoom here, and we're going to go ahead and drop our first one now. So we'd love to see your responses. Um, there it is. We'll, we'll revisit that in a bit. Uh, Tommy, I want to talk to you. You've talked a little bit about how, you know, you're not the expert and um, you really want to meet people on sort of the, the ground level of sustainability. Why do you think that approach, that really accessible approach is so important to meeting your goals and you know the goals of your mission? Um, yeah, good question. So I think from, from, I've said it and I've said it before and I'll say it again, we're not experts. And I think sometimes the space that we are in, in regards to environmental space and eco, um, we're sometimes talking, we're preaching to the choir in such that in the fact that everyone here is probably aware of plastics and aware of climate change and all these environmental issues. Um, I think also on a secondary to that is that sometimes all of these, all of these issues are so overwhelming. Sustainability in, in its broadest term is, I think is so overwhelming for your everyday person. And I think there is, there is, a mass a huge gap where you've got a lot of people um a lot of organizations in in the sp in the environmental space like extinction rebellion greenpeace who are pushing the buttons and pushing the boundaries and questions that need to be asked for the powers that be but i think there's some sort of detachment from your everyday person and i always talk about your everyday person because if you look at your generic bell chart, if it, I think that's the right bell graph, um, there's a huge majority of people that probably realistically don't really think about um, sustainability and plastics or, or anything. But I feel that where we have a lot of power as people and for, for what me and Rebecca are doing, that is our niche, as it, even though it's one huge niche, but if we can inspire one person to make one simple change, that's our slogan, make, and, and start, that, start that first step on a ladder of, of sustainability, um, to make them just think about and be conscious and be aware of, okay, there is a problem here, I'll start brushing my teeth in the morning, start and end your day in a sustainable way, brushing teeth. And I don't want to plug our products, but I think it's quite powerful in the simplicity of it. Once you've opened someone's eyes to that, they're on their journey. And I, I feel very passionate about that aspect of if we can get one person to start their journey and then allow them to navigate this whole space how they want, there's the potential is huge. Um, and then going on from that, our, our three uh, like main pillars that we talk about is edu educate, inspire and empower. And I think for us, they're really important in every aspect that we do, that if we can educate someone, there's enough facts out there around plastic pollution and, uh, and any aspect. If we can educate someone and give them the facts, We'll give them some sort of inspiration to take take action and then empower them with the with the knowledge and the action to go and tell one person in in its simplest form if that can be replicated all over the world there's a lot of action to be taken so that aspect of for the people 
I think it's just very for us. It's we're not we're very transparent. We hold our hands up. We're not experts. We're not trying to be complex. We're not trying to be complicated and find some new wonderful synthetic material that's going to change the world. Let's just go back to basics. Keep it simple. Get people involved. Get as one sim we our, our slogan is one simple change multiplied by millions and we will change the world. And we genuinely believe it. And it sounds like Nicky, what he's doing with Foamy is exactly the same. And I think then you've got a power of people pushing the boundaries this end um, and then you're engaging and, and you're, you're inspiring that mass group of people in the middle to make simple changes that we're going in the right direction. So, yeah, I think there's, I just think there's a lot of power in people and I'm maybe oblivious to it, but I believe in positive of, of people. And if we can just get one person to do one thing and inspire one more person and then just replicate that a million times, there's a lot of, there's a lot of potential. Tommy, social media has been so essential to your, your business strategy and how you get your message out there. Can you talk about, yeah, just more about your strategy and how you use it as this lever for, for change? Uh, yeah. So Social media, our, our background was social media. So our role, when we, going back to what my sto our, our story, our role was to promote travel. So I'll go and take beautiful, beautiful photos of beautiful places. And that was it. But I think nowadays that um, there's no getting around it. Social media is so integrated with our lives. Um, everyone is on social media. My nan, and she's in her late 80s. She's in on social media and she loves it. So it's, I, th I think it's just, how can we use it in a positive way? People, a lot of people, a lot of people use it for just switching off and you just scroll in um, and you're just interacting with people and as it is. But I think if we can um, take a certain percentage of um, our time on social media, and use that as education in no matter what that is, whether it's environmental, whether it's um, ethical issues, whether it's w whatever they are, but just learn something and use the, use what we already have and what we already use in for 25% of the day, let's use it to learn a new skill or let's learn, um, use it to learn about plastic pollution or let's use it to learn about humanitarian issues in Africa that we'll never know about. Um, I think that's really, again, I think it's really powerful. And if you had a whole, everyone, a million people doing that, there's a lot of good that comes from that. So how we used it, and then going back to how we started with the business, we had no money. So the only way we, we were able to launch uh, the business was we actually, we were, well, here's a little story. Not many people know this, but um, our first batch of toothbrushes um, was actually funded um by we did a trip in europe and we had to travel around europe and highlight all these amazing places but the social media world that we were in um we had a camper van our camper van got broken into and rebecca's laptop got stolen um and we never re we never really had insurance which is i'm not that's not good but we had insurance on this trip and it was like fate and the amount of money that we received from the insurance claim for Rebecca's laptop was within seven pounds of the cost of our first batch of toothbrushes. So that's how we started. Um, but yeah, we never had any money. So we didn't have any, we didn't go and get investment. We didn't go for rounds of investment and get shareholders. We didn't start it as a business. We started it as a way to get people inspired around what we were beginning to be passionate about. Um, and then, so we were like, how can we market everything? We didn't really, we still now, we don't know what we're doing, but we had that, we had our toothbrushes and we started, um, we were working in Cambodia and I, we were doing some promo shots and I took a photo like this with Rebecca and I was like, this is excellent. Like when we launch with our hashtag 1 million, let's launch it with this. And then we would um, get people, customers, um, taking photos of our products and then we got them to post it on their social media uh, we did that because also I think there's a lot of brands out there that use very glamorous models which are amazing and pretty um, but we want we really wanted to make it an everyday going back to everyday aspect so we got customers to take photos 
and then it just snowballed to be honest we were getting people um, from all over the world who had bought our toothbrush they then put it onto their social media um, a, just a photo like that um, which then spread it spread more awareness to their um, to their followers then we get more sales of toothbrushes they would then take a photo I think we've now so that was all it was so that's how we use social media um, I think we've now received about 5,000 photos of people around the world in all these wonderful places. We've got ones with people in the Taj Mahal in the background, like the Sydney Harbour Bridge, um, in that we've got people underwater doing scuba diving. It sounds crazy, but all it is is people taking a photo like this. Um, but yeah, so that's how we that's how we launched it. So we had the hashtag 1 million by 2020. Essentially, we wanted to sell a million toothbrushes from the bedroom at mum and dad's house. Um, and we launched it with that campaign. So it's just kind of a way. And to... how far did you get? Oh, yeah, we hit our target in uh, nine months. Very um, good. I, we've just we've just hit 1.9 million toothbrushes nice. that, we, that we sold. Um, Congrats. So thank you. We're very yeah, we're very proud. We don't openly um, we don't openly shout about it. Sorry for putting you on the spot. No, it's all good. It's but you can tell the entire story and then leave us hanging. You know. <laughs> no, it's true. Um, but yeah, we um, so yeah, so so that's how we used. So from that, we were just using social media, getting people engaged and and uh, and getting people more people involved in the social media movement from that that's where we've got some of our biggest partnerships from our social media movement so we're now we're now the first bamboo toothbrush in the skies with our partnership with virgin atlantic we're official partners for team gb at the olympics uh, we've worked with plastic oceans the superstars uh, but also the uk royal fan that i don't want to name drop but we're very proud of the work that we've done so so that's in answer to your question john that's how we use social media just like that i love it congratulations that's amazing um all right looks like we have the results of our first poll question we're going to go ahead and share those amazing 70 percent of you think that shopping with an eco-friendly business is essential um we're gonna drop one more question in here and while you are responding i'm gonna throw it to nikki um you know speaking of shopping with eco-friendly businesses being essential nikki what are some of the the trends you're seeing related to consumer demand for for more eco-friendly products sure um so yeah as i said when we when we launched the brand in 2018 we were amongst the very first ones to have this type of product or actually the first one in real retail and not in more niche stores but like sort of really going into the mass market and since then in the past years the space have has massively massively grown from call it a lot of competitors from the indie space young startup brands that want to try um, and sort of hop on the train of eco-friendly uh, products or plastic-free uh, care, hair care especially, to also really large industry players yeah, from the brands uh, that you have mentioned before. We have now uh, really globally competitors from P&G, Unilever, um, Henkel and L'Oreal. And I really think it's a good thing because even if these big guys jump on this ship, now you can say there it might be greenwashing or it might not be as sustainable as, as if one small startup with only two people who really get their hands dirty all the time and um, come up with these products. But I think it is only positive because it can create even more global awareness for these issues. And what do these large industry powerhouses have? that us younger companies um, that sort of try and stir up the industry don't have so much deep pockets full of budget and money that can really portray the message out into the world, which at the end of the day, we guys will also end up benefiting from. Um, so the trend is strongly, stro strongly growing. Another super successful brand, which we launched six years ago is vegan hair care. Today, back then, vegan hair care wasn't something uh, super out of the box extraordinary today everybody has it yeah back then it was it really set us apart and today you cannot launch a brand without it being vegan or uh, friendly to animals and i think with this ever-growing demand of consumers also big industry players will have to start thinking um how we always say with foamy think outside the bottle uh, this is sort of our hashtag uh, because 
is not think outside the box, but bottles since we don't have bottles. Um, and they will have to start uh, doing the same thing. And uh, this is something that everyone here will continue benefiting from. Nikki, switching gears, I it's been kind of a, a harrowing summer when it comes to climate crisis related natural disasters. I know where I'm from in the Pacific Northwest in the United States, we've set just mind boggling temperature records. Now there's been flooding in Germany and in India, China, throughout the world. I'm curious what you think, like when it comes to the climate crisis, what's the responsibility of business? I think it's a huge responsibility. Um, probably of businesses even more than of individuals, because you sort of also give a home to people, you offer them a workplace, you are the one that is responsible for putting products out there, making sure they come to work if they're not uh, working from, from remote. So you as a, as a, a business, I think has, has a very high responsibility. We um, are on a way to becoming a B Corp. Yeah, we just decided this a few months ago that our group, New Flag Group, which is, as I said, the owner of Foamy, um, really wants to become more sustainable in the entire supply chain when it comes to all of its uh, employees. And Foamy as a brand is on its way to becoming CO2 neutral. And we once this is complete, we will do the same for the, the entire group that sort of stands behind it. It is a super long winded and very intense process, uh, which really takes up a lot of people's time. But I think it is essential because you cannot, on the one hand, portray the story of being plastic free and being conscious and sustainable without checking all the other boxes that uh, go alongside. And now our company is more than 300 people. We have offices in eight uh, countries around the world. So it is super, super complex and making sure that we become CO2 neutral and that we sort of tick all these boxes will take a long time, much longer than for a younger company where it's just a young founder team um, that are super hands-on in sort of the entire supply chain. But I think it is our responsibility, and especially when comparing ourselves to the even larger industry players that have a much larger global impact, I think it is essential, especially looking into the future, because we are also the ones that set a sign uh, for the rest of the people working in the industry. Yeah, Avocado recently went through that B Corp process, and it's intense, but we found it to be so worth it in the end. Um, exactly, and the girl, bit, but... the girl, the girl in the company uh, that uh, sort of is the team lead. She is she's part of our legal team, and she really wanted to become a, a part of uh, this sort of B Corp uh, certification team because she says it is such a nice, the, despite being so demanding, it is such a nice, meaningful project because you really have the feeling of doing something uh, good and giving back um, back to the world. Um, so yeah, we're excited for the journey, at least to say the least. Well, good luck with it. Um, Nikki, I'm curious what you've touched on this a little bit, but what else do you think the, the future of eco business looks like? Like how, how are things going to change in the next, you know, five, 10, 20 years? I think there will be, more players will come into the space of beauty and personal care, but outside of the, the fast moving consumer goods world, more and more companies are, are sort of popping up that want to become more sustainable and um, be it in food, be it in technology. Um, and I think it will just become a given um, that you cannot launch products out into the world if you don't have uh, bring this eco footprint with you in, in whatever respect. It doesn't necessarily have to be, be plastic free, yeah? but the whole... It, global trend of reducing the amount of food you take of meat you take in because this has a major impact on on the environment and all of these things i think they will just become part of our day-to-day -day and less of the reason for having a panel to make people aware about because everybody will be aware about it and it would just be sort of really deeply rooted into into our society especially i have a younger brother yeah he's eight years younger than myself and for them it is even more a topic than for us I, I don't want to say i'm old i'm only 32 but the younger the generations get and the more people sort of become adults and grow up with this the, these topics the more um uh, autom automatic and self-explanatory it will become and uh, therefore large corporations as well as younger indie, indie companies will have this uh, topic in the very center um of their reason for existence 
John, just to go on from um, Nikki as well, I've, for me, and I, I don't know whether I'm again being optimistic, but I think I would, I, I see that in the future business will be there for good. I think it's becoming like what Susie was saying in the fact that 1% for the planet before that, Susie was donating to projects that are really important. I think that would, I would like to think that that will start to become the norm in the fact that business is there, yes, to make a profit, but also to be able to give back to that specific niche or that area in which that, that business operates in. And I think we're possibly going through a bit of a transition period at the moment in the fact that up until now, business has just been profit, 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 profit. Um, but now consumers, uh, customers uh, and businesses want more. And I think people want more. I think people want a deeper message in where the product is, how it's created, all of that. Whereas before, customers didn't really know too much. Whereas there's so much information out there now that as businesses and as brands you need to give and obviously at the start it will be unnatural for a lot of businesses but i for us it's very natural to give for us to build a business that gives back and creates these projects but i'd like to think that in as we grow and as younger generations come through this just becomes the norm and um but again, I might just be optimistic. And making a profit yeah, is also not uh, something to be afraid of or is also not something bad because you can take these profits and reinvest them into whatever it is, growing your brand, giving to charity, growing your business, investing into meaningful projects. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, I don't want there to be the connotation, oh, profit automatically means everybody gets rich and uh, takes a jet and uh, destroys the environment again. Um, so there's also very meaningful things that you can do. Um, and if you look at our brand, all of our personal care products are, uh, are manufactured in the European Union, um, also from a sustainability standpoint, and not only in Germany, in the UK, UK is European Union anymore, but sort of in Europe. And uh, this is something that we obviously also take very serious. And yet we can still make a profit and continue to reinvest in the brand to help it grow. So making a profit doesn't automatically mean you have to exploit people or operate uh, uh, a shitty business. Not at all. Uh, it, it all really works. And at the same time, I also um, always say that the customer, the end consumer also has to be aware that running a conscious business is definitely more cost then if you would just source from Asia and uh, sort of um, ship it across the world where labor might be uh, cheaper, this also comes at a price. And then if you say, hey, I as a consumer want to do a change and then you end up in the uh, supermarket or drugstore in front of the shelf, have the conscious choice. Am I willing to spend a dollar more and therefore have a more conscious uh, produced uh, item or am I going to spend a dollar less um, just to save money? But at the end of the day, um, choose the less sustainable brand or product. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Tommy and Nikki, both for your responses there. Um, so I we have about seven minutes left and we have a bunch of questions um, piling up. I want to make sure we get to our Q&A. Um, while we start this, we're going to look at the results of our second poll. What is most important in determining if a company is eco-friendly? What they tell me on Instagram, I uh, got only 1% of the vote. That's probably a good thing. Um, their products, materials, or ingredients got the highest percentage, 61% uh, of that vote. So we're going to drop one more poll in for you here. Um, and I'm going to go with one of the first questions that came up, um, something we think about a lot at Avocado. Um, it's a question about compostable packaging. Will compostable packaging be a good solution to the ecosystem in the long run? um John, and it's, Adam, a different, yeah. it's a different one the poll the, the poll questions come up what environmental issues keep you up at night most oh you're right that is uh that is our our third and last poll question i was going over to our q a questions um from the audience but all good thanks for for clarifying um so yeah i don't know uh i would like to hear your answer one? do you want to it's about compostable say, packaging takes, and being a good solution for ecosystems in the long run. Is that something that your company has has looked at? Sorry, was that about composting products? Is that we? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the I didn't hear the question. So sorry, say it again. 
He said if compostable packagings uh -oh. are a good solution for the future and the environment. I think we are frozen. Okay. okay. Can you hear me? You are frozen, John. We can hear everyone yeah. except for John. Yeah. Or? Okay. John, did you ask now that question back. of me or? Yeah, is that a yeah. nod? <laughs> My apologies. Yeah. yeah, I looks like I have an unstable connection, but yeah, would love to hear your response to that, Susie. About compostability. Okay, it is critical because, um, you know, yes, we've been plastic free since 1995. Um, but you, you know, the part of being part of the circular economy is we, you know, it's not just about sourcing, and we do source from ecologically managed resources. Um, but this is why we went through the M13432 um, to show that at the end of the process, you can it can be composted and it goes back into the environment as compost to grow crops. So you know, being composting compost compostable for us uh, is really critical for for our, our understanding and consciousness about the circular economy, that you, you take something from the environment and it goes back into the environment without having a negative impact on it. But clearly there, there are products that you can't compost, but then they need to be recyclable uh, and widely recyclable. So for us as a, of a product, um, it is important to be compostable, especially where you're, you know, we're in 80 countries around the world, um, and some of those places that we're in, they don't have curb, well, the US doesn't have curb, curbside recycling, number one, although I see there's some bills that have come in that's going to change that. But when you're selling into nations where there is no waste management, um, that, you know, if, if you just dispose of it in the environment, there's no one coming to collect it, it's important for us that you can compost it in your domestic compost bin or, uh, you know, and you will break down your compost. So it, it's thinking about the end use. It's not, not just enough to solve the sourcing problems, you really have to think right down the line as to the disposable side of it as well, because this is this is critical part of the management that you're putting the resources back into the chain, uh, into the circular chain. So, um, it, it, you know, this zero, zero impact, it, you know, there's never no such thing as a zero impact. Everything that we do has an impact and it and it chalks up somewhere. Our objective is to make the minimum impact through our sourcing of materials and disposal at the end. Um, and our EPD that we do measures our sourcing and we have a massively low um, carbon footprint, um, but obviously conscious that when you're shipping to 80, 80 countries around the world, they're shipping, um, you know, they're, they're not, there are no ships that are solar as yet. So transport is, an, is going to impact on that. So yes, composting for us in our category is a, is a critical factor. Um, and we are the only certified compostable domain hygiene range at this point. So, because I think it cost us, just so you know where you're in the game here, I think we pay, we've, it's thus far, it's cost us about 160,000 euros to go through the, the composting um, certification process. Um, so, it's not a cheap thing to do. But at the end, as I said, you know, when you're validating your statements, um, you have to be you have to be prepared to to make sure you can you know hold it to the highest um, the highest uh, um, uh, investigation that you know you can poke your finger into any corner of our company and you'll find goodness. <laughs> I hope. Thanks, Susie. Um, so I you know I think this is the sign of a good good panel, but we're running out of time um, despite our many many. Good questions in here. I'm actually going to throw it back to Todd because I want to make sure we have time for the giveaway here. Uh, I'm just going to share the last poll results first. So what environmental issue keeps you up at night the most? Um, it's kind of split across the board. So plastic pollution at 31%, climate crisis uh, as the highest percent at 38%, environmental racism, racism at 6%, and species and diversity loss at 26%. Um, so Susie, Tommy, Nikki, thank you so much for your insight. This was thank so you. valuable. Really appreciate it. Um, and Todd, back to you. All right. Wow. What a what a what a great com what a great conversation. Uh, uh, very engaging. So guy follows up yesterday. The same thing. We had just an amazing conversation yesterday as well. So listen, I want to thank everybody. I think Susie, Tommy, John, Nicholas. What a what a diverse uh, panel and moderator uh, group to be to be discussing this with so many different angles and varying degrees of experience, which I think is amazing. Um, and we thank all you, all the attendees. We're gonna announce the book winners in just a moment, but we thank all of you for logging on. 
Um, yeah, just we'll, we'll have five winners. We're going to get the hardcover edition of Living Without Plastic. We're going to ship that out to you guys right away. Uh, we want to thank all of our sponsors again, because we really wouldn't be able to do any of this without them. And, and not only do I want to thank them for the obvious of just supporting us in general, but what it does is it allows us to really take individual donations and 100% of them directly um, funneling into direct action in the field. So we, you can see in there, we've got Montes Wines as our presenting sponsor for the festival. Avocado, of course, EcoWatch, One Tree Planet. If you're looking for daily news on environmental issues, definitely log on to ecowatch.com. It's, it's a great resource for that. Of course, we thank Bamboo Brush, uh, Tommy and Rebecca. We thank Foamy, uh, Nicholas and his team at Foamy, Susie and her team at Natural Care, who came on very, very early in the process with Avocado long, long before um, any of us even, even knew for sure we could have a festival because of the, the global pandemic. So it was, it's really great to have that kind of support from folks early on who believe in something. So uh, once again, thanking the sponsors there. Okay, how about our book winners? Let's see who those five lucky folks are. And there we go. Tristan Yoon, Veronica Brooms or Brumes, Claire Tran, Jason Antoline, and Rob Furness. Um, once again, you are going to all receive a hardcover edition of Living Without Plastic. That's our new, fairly new hardcover um, or uh, book from Artisan Books, published by Artisan Books, written by Christine Wong and Bridget Allen. Um, so once again, uh, this is a second in a series of panel discussions. Tomorrow's panel discussions, uh, we have two of them tomorrow, one at 11 a.m. Eastern time, which I believe is 3 p.m. GMT. Um, documentaries and environmental movements and how environmental movements are using documentary films to really tell their story and to be an educational, powerful education tool. Uh, the second one is kind of an interesting one for me, near and dear to my heart, is wine. So climate change's impact on the wine industry. And there you see our panelists there, really impressive. Genevieve Jansen is just an icon in, in, in Napa Valley, California, where she really was very much um, became one of the well, very much high levels of success at the Robert Mondavi winery when very few women were, were really um, really allowed to do that in Napa Valley back in the 80s when she first came into it. So Allison Jordan's the VP of Environmental Affairs at the Wine Institute, Aurelio Montez from our presenting sponsor, Montez Wine, and Dr. Elizabeth Lokovich from the University of British Columbia. So log on to that. You're going to see how environmental factors and consumer sustainability demands are really shifting business models in the wine industry, how they grow grapes, where they grow them, when they grow them, how they package their product and so forth. So um, with that, again, thank you everybody. Trees and Seas Festival, go to plasticoceans.org, find out more about that. Please support these companies that have really supported us. That's really how you can kind of keep this movement going well beyond Trees and Seas and as a year round ongoing thing. Once again, uh, John, Tommy, Susie, um, wow, well, uh, Nicholas, sorry. Uh, thank you once again. And folks, just log on tomorrow for our next panel discussions and go to the website to see what we have going on. Thanks so much, everybody. Until next time. Thanks.